for a couple of years. And uh, so it's nice to have a Colossians today. It's a, a short book. It's only four chapters. So we'll be going through this during the summertime and into September. And, uh, and I want to encourage you to uh, read it on your own and become very familiar with it. We're going to be going through it week by week and studying uh, not only the content and its interpretation, but also its application. And I pray that it will be as a blessing to you as it has been to me in preparation. So turn to the book of Colossians and uh, we'll read the first eight verses to begin with today and, uh, and then spend some time examining its interpretation and application. So Colossians chapter one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who were in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven of which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. Father, again, we come and we just ask that you would bless the teaching of your word. God, just, you know, invigorate me, empower me. I've done the study. I, I know the text, but I'm asking God that you would bring it to life in the teaching. And God, that you would touch every heart here for greater intimacy, for greater confidence, and greater joy in the solid, unshakable foundation we have in Christ. So Father, lead our time. Holy Spirit, guide and direct. And we want to thank you in advance, even before we finish, for what you're going to do. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Colossians is is a phenomenal book. It really is a book about the supremacy of Christ, but it answers a lot of questions that were on the heart and the lips of the pastor of the church in Colossae who happened to be Epaphras. And Epaphras had concerns, and some of those concerns are very similar to the concerns we have today. Uh, For instance, was Jesus just a prophet, a moral teacher, an ascended master, or was he the son of God? And more specifically, was he God? Another question they were struggling with is, does it matter what we eat? Does it matter what we eat, either ceremonial ceremonial with the Old Testament covenant? Does it matter what we eat, if we're vegan or if we like lao lao and pork hash? Does it matter? Does it matter what day we worship on? Are we still bound by the Old Testament covenant of the Sabbath? Are we bound by the day of the Sabbath? Or are we bound by the Sabbath at all? Those are questions that they were facing. Is harsh treatment of the body a successful remedy for overcoming sin? In other words, can we discipline ourselves and self-discipline ourselves into perfection? Is it possible for a person by virtue of the harsh treatment of the body actually to work their way into a place of not just sinless perfection, because that's, that's, that's not even a biblical concept uh, as it relates to this fallen life that we're in, but is it possible for a person to get incrementally better by, by harsh treatment of the body? Is it okay to mix the teachings of Christ with the teachings of other religions, and most notably, Eastern mysticism, which was a problem in Colossae at that time, a problem here in Kauai as well? And the final question, aren't all religions in the end leading to the same God? Isn't Allah the same as Yahweh, as same as the Hindu gods and the pantheistic approach they have, isn't the same as every god of every religion. Perhaps we're all just pursuing the same god of a different name and the door is all going to lead, these paths all lead to the same door, which is the eternal kingdom of heaven. These are problems and, and theological issues the church in Colossae was facing. And they're, they're issues that we face as well. Most of you, just as I went through these, you, you, you already know the answers to these questions. But what Paul was presenting to the church in Colossae was not just an understanding, no, that's wrong, yes, that's right, no, that's wrong, no, that's not right. What he was presenting was a doctrine and a theology that they could present to other people and explain themselves why these things are either right or wrong 
and how we can be found in the perfect will of God. And so this morning, I want to give an introduction to this book. You've got notes in your bulletin. I'd encourage you to pull those out. And hopefully you have a pen with you and a Bible. If you, if you don't come to church with a pen and your Bible, I would encourage you to start doing that uh, so that you can really be a participant in uh, not only listening, but actively uh, writing so that you can remember these things and use these notes as future reference in your own study. So let's talk with the people uh, about the people of Colossians first. We want to talk about the author of the book. We know the author to be Paul. He identifies himself as apostolos, which is one that is specially called by someone to represent that individual. So Paul is an apostolos with a capital A. I say capital A because there's only 12 people that were designated as apostles. Those are the 12 disciples. In the book of Acts, when when they were trying to replace Judas, who had uh, committed suicide, they were looking for someone that could be an apostle. And part of the criteria was they had to be a witness of the ministry of Christ and a witness of his death and resurrection. That's That's a small crowd of people as it relates to history. So once that that generation passed on, there was no one else that could take that role. And so the apostles with a capital A were those that were alive at the time of Christ. But there are apostles with a small a. I'm writing it backwards. That's probably bad, but I'm so dyslexic, I couldn't do it the other way. So anyway, uh, there are apostles with a small a. Why do we know this? Because in chapter 17 of the book of John, Jesus prays to the Father and says, Father, as you sent me, sent apostolos. Apostolos, as you sent me as your ambassador, I am now sending these. He's talking to the 12. Apostole in the plural. So he's sending these as you sent me. And he made them ambassadors of the message of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And now we are now messengers of that message of reconciliation. And because of that, we are called to be ambassadors of that message. Which gets me back to what I was talking about a few moments ago is that you know, there's a real tendency. The enemy wants to, wants to derail the work that God has planned for you to do. There's no question. He wants to take you out of the game. He wants to take you out through sin. He wants to take you out through distraction. He wants to take you out through discouragement. He wants to take you out in any way he can through conflict with other people, with your spouse, with your kids, with your finances. He wants to take you out. And one of the ways that Satan can take out Christians is by distracting them with things and and with concerns that they don't have power and authority over directly and move them away from things that they do have power and authority over personally. And Paul says that we are ambassadors of this message of reconciliation. And he says, I've invested you with power. You are my apostole. You are the ones that are being sent out by me, by the power of God, in the name of God, by the spirit of God, to do what I've called you to do, which is to seek and save the lost, preach the gospel, and make disciples. This is what we can do. So, in your concern about what's happening in the areas that you have no power and no authority, don't let that consume and overtake your life and derail you from the things that you do have power and authority to participate in by Almighty God, because he's made you ambassadors of this wonderful reconciliation of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul says he's not just any apostle. He's an apostle of Jesus Christ. It's interesting, the way the Greek is, is, uh, is phrased here, it can mean either belonging to or sent by. Belonging to is a possessive genitive and sent by is the genitive of source. So Paul is saying, I am an apostle belonging to or sent by Jesus Christ. And I would say it's both. He belongs to Christ and he's sent by Christ. And so are you. I am as well. We are belonging to Christ as those that have accepted Christ, and now we are sent by Christ. This is awesome. We, we have so much power. At all these moments, you know, when I read the news and everything, I, I feel powerless. Don't you kind of feel a little powerless? I feel like everything's spinning out of control, and it's, it's just like we're just going down this, this, these rapids, and there's a waterfall on the end of it, and it's like we, we can't get out, and we can't stop the water. That's how it feels. And yet... God says through Paul that we belong to God and we've been sent in the midst of this crisis to do his work. Here's the crazy part. 
and I, forgive me, this is a completely flawed illustration. It just popped in my head, so, but I'm going to share it with you. When, when Becky and I were in, um, uh, in Bend, Oregon, uh, we decided to do some rafting, and we didn't have rafts, so I, I got our, our twin mattresses that we used, uh, uh, inflatable twin mattresses from our camping. And I filled them up, and I said, we're going we're gonna to go down the rapids in our twin mattresses. <laughs> You get in twin mattresses, and I had a kayak paddle. She had nothing. I had her tethered to my ankle on a long rope, and, and the rope was tied around her, her twin mattress. So she had no control whatsoever, completely dependent upon me. But I was really didn't have a lot of control either because I'm on a twin mattress uh, going down rapids. And, and here's the thing. I've never laughed so hard and had such a good time in my life. I, I probably have. I've laughed hard a lot in life. But, I mean, I was really just... I was, I was turned into a puddle. I couldn't even navigate or steer as we went down seven or eight rapids like this, and, and it was just hilarious. But, you know, in, in a sense, we're, 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 we're on rapids, kind of in twin air mattresses, all of us. We don't have a lot of control. We don't even feel like we've got a paddle. And the thing is, is there are people around us, all around us, that are going down the same rapids, the same uh, raging torrent of a river, and they're screaming bloody murder. They're just out of control. They feel completely hopeless and helpless. But because we belong to Christ, because we know the beginning from the end, because we know that we're secure in Christ, we're actually able to care for people along the way as we're going over the falls. We're going over the falls. I hate to say it, but... I don't talk, I'm not talking about America. I'm saying that, that God is going to bring his wrath and his punishment upon earth. That is fixed in God's eternal economy. So we are in that rapid. At some times it gets worse than others and it backs off and it's placid and we think, oh, we're in good times. These are good. And then the rapids come again and then we hit another rough patch in the river and we think we're going to die. And, and then it gets placid again. I don't know what's coming. I really can't tell you uh, except what prophecy says, but I want to tell you that we're safe and secure and there are people around us that need us to be a calming influence and extend to them the hope of Christ. We're not going to get out of this, but we can extend the hope of Christ of not only peace and confidence as we go down the rapids, but a knowledge that in the end, the rapids aren't going to finish us off, that we have an eternal destiny with Jesus Christ. That's a really rocky illustration. I'm sorry, but it's what came to mind. So I, I ran with it. I, I hope it's helpful to you. But Paul says, I belong to Christ and I'm, I'm sent by Christ. The Bible tells us again in 1 Corinthians 6 that we've been bought at a price. We are not our own and therefore we belong to Christ. And he goes on to say, and because you're not your own, you need to offer yourselves in service to God. And this is the calling that Paul had belonging to Christ and sent by Christ, and he says it's by the will of God. He's not a ladder climber. He's not, he's not uh, uh, clamoring and walking over other people to gain a, a position of an apostle. God called him, and God has called us, as he called Paul. Well, he also mentions another name here in the opening verse. He talks about Timothy, and he calls him our brother. Timothy was Paul's son in the faith. Uh, he was his disciple, his companion in ministry, and also a pastor. And, you know, I, I was having, a, uh, Mike and Becky and I were having our family devotions uh, yesterday um, morning. And we, st we started in the book of First Timothy. And as we're going through this, Paul actually gives a, a clearer designation for Timothy. He says, my true son in the faith. Here he calls him his brother. And he's a younger man, uh, but he calls him his true son in the faith. And I, I was really taken by that. We talked about it for about 10 minutes or so. And we're thinking about what does that mean to be a true son of the faith? What does that look like? And I can tell you what it looks like. It looks like Jesus. It looks like somebody that's pursuing Christ. It looks like somebody that is actually following the model of Paul in such a way that somebody else was infected with his passion for the kingdom of God. And Paul saw it working itself out and through the, the heart of Timothy. And he said, my, you're, you're, you're like my true son in the faith. You're like my brother from another mother. It's that whole same concept. You know, it's like we share everything in common. And why? Not because he was just following Paul, but because he was following Christ. And he calls him our brother. Now, what I love about this is that we, we find out some leadership principles about Paul in the way he led. And I want to encourage you because all of us have some form of leadership in life. It might be as a husband or as a parent, a mom. It might be that you own a business or that you have employees under you might be in your community, might be in the church, 
but wherever it is, take note of the kind of leader that Paul was. Because he very easily could have just said, the Apostle Paul is now speaking, and left everyone else's name out. But he includes all these other names, uh, including Timothy. And he recognized the partnership of those that served with him. This is what Paul did by bringing up Timothy's name. He says that I want you guys to know I'm not by myself. I'm not doing all this alone. Timothy, my brother, my true son in the faith, we share the same heart and the same passion and the same love and the same commitment and the same calling. And we're walking together in this mission. It also promoted the gifts and abilities of people that served with them. And that's what we need to do. We need to recognize people in, in, in our community, in our, in our sphere of influence, and we need to do that publicly. And we need to find things that people are doing well and, 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 and let people know around us. Wow, did you know this guy can do that? Did you know that they blessed me here? Did you hear about what they did over here? I call it holy gossip. Holy gossip. You know that's what this is right now, right? Can I tell you why? Does anybody not know what holy gossip is? First time you've heard holy gossip, raise your hand. Oh, quite a few of you. Okay, so you know what gossip is. That's saying potentially true things about somebody behind their back. Uh, very damaging. Holy gossip is when you say things publicly in front of people's back or in their front. <laughs> uh, and you're saying it in front of them and you're lifting them up and you are highlighting their successes and their character and the blessing they are to you in your life. That's holy gossip. So Epaphras, who was a pastor, had reported to Paul about the church in Colossae and was in prison with Paul at the time, reported the things that, about Colossae, and he engaged in holy gossip and was talking about the church in Colossae. Now Paul is engaging in the same way with Timothy, and in written form, he's giving holy gossip about the blessing that Timothy is. So he recognized him in partnership, he promoted the gifts and abilities of Timothy, and he demonstrated his interdependence on those that he worked with. He was not a lone ranger, he was not a wolf on his own. This was a man that understand, understood that though at one time he was very arrogant and proud and a ladder climber, he was not that man any longer. He was a man who was interdependent, knew he needed other Christian men in his life, women needing women, men needing men, accountability, uh, partnership, that we can't do this alone. And so he models this. And so it's a, great, it's a great leadership principle, not only in the kingdom of God and church, but also just anywhere. Be this kind of man, be this kind of woman that elevates other people publicly when you have the opportunity. The rest of the recipients of this book are certainly the city of Colossae, which is modern-day Turkey, which is about 98% Muslim right now and uh, a, a, a very difficult place to do ministry, but people are still there serving the Lord. It was a very pagan city. It was a place where there was a, uh, an enclave of, of Jewish followers, Old Testament followers of God, and, uh, but it was predominantly Gentile, meaning in that Greco-Roman world is that they were predominantly pantheists, meaning they served many, a, a plethora of gods, and that they were uh, uh, pagan. And that was their background, that was their culture. And that's the group of people that Paul is writing to. But he's also writing to the church in Colossae, in particular. And it's a church that he didn't plant. It's a church filled with people he's never even met. The only connection that Paul has with the church in Colossae is one man named Epaphras. In the book of Acts chapter 19 verse 10, when Paul was in Ephesus, he was preaching the gospel. And there was a young man named Epaphras who was there and heard the message of the gospel, received Christ, became a, a follower of Christ, and was mentored by Paul. By virtue of that, Paul sent him back home to his hometown, because Epaphras was from Turkey, sent him back and said, go preach the gospel to your family and your friends and your loved ones and your country. Epaphras responded, went back with the gospel, planted the church in Colossae, and God blessed it enormously. But the only connection in all this was simply one man obeying the command as one belonging to Christ, sent by Christ to preach the gospel of Christ, and it touched the heart of another man who then did the same, and on and on it goes. And the only reason we're even here today, and the only reason that you've accepted Christ is because somebody else down the chain did that. And it's been going on for 2,000 years is there are people that are taking the risk and they're walking in obedience and they're, they're loving others enough. They love God enough and they love others enough to communicate to you so that you could respond to and receive 
the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so it's a beautiful example of church planting uh, that we have right here in the context of the book of Colossae, or the, the book of Colossians. Now, we have a number of other people that are mentioned. Uh, I'll go over these briefly, these members of the Colossian church. Epaphras, of course, I've already mentioned him, a native of Colossae, a servant of Christ, a fervent prayer warrior, a fellow prisoner of Christ, uh, of, uh, fellow prisoner of Paul at the time of the writing of this book, and a man that was martyred for his faith. Uh, historically, we know that. Archippus is another gentleman. Uh, he was an elder in Colossae, a fellow soldier with Paul. Uh, he was exhorted by Paul to complete the mission. Very interesting. This guy started out really well in his walk with God and the mission of being a, a disciple maker and taking on this calling. And somewhere along the line, Archippus got distracted. He got distracted by things in the world, probably by family, his house, his business. We don't know exactly what distracted him. But he got pulled out of the battle. And he, probably better yet, he, he walked away from the battle. He didn't get pulled out. He, he walked out of the battle. And Paul will write him in the final chapter of, of, Coloss of Colossians in verse 17 and say, specifically call this guy out. And he said, Archippus, you received a calling. Get back to work. And I want to share something with us because I read this and I thought, wow, that's a good word for me. I have a calling. I need to get to work. You have a calling. We need to get back to work. And I'm not saying we aren't, but I'm just saying it's an encouragement. That's what Paul was doing with this, uh, with this gentleman. He was saying, you had a calling. You started out so well, but you got derailed somewhere along the way, and you became so consumed and so busy with everything else that this primary mission I've given you has taken a backseat to everything else. And so he says, bring that back up to the front, and I'll take care of the rest. That's the message of the Bible. There are two other people, Philemon and Onesimus. Philemon, you might recognize that name because it's a book of the Bible. He was a slave owner, and one of his slaves happened to be named Onesimus. Onesimus ditched the slave life, ran away, went AWOL, and became a Christian under Paul's mentorship and preaching the gospel. And this beautiful reconciliation took place between the slave owner and the runaway slave uh, that you'll enjoy when we get to that part of the text. But I want to talk about the problems of, of Colossians, what they were facing as a church. Uh, as I said, Epaphras brought back great reports about the church. They evidenced true faith in Christ. I'm just lifting this right out of the text of uh, Colossians. They were fruitful, and the gospel was spreading through them. And they were orderly in their worship, and they were firm in their faith. But they did have challenges. One of the challenges that they were facing was paganism, a return to paganism. Paganism defined uh, in Colossians 3.5 as sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Wow, that list sounds like today, doesn't it? These are the, I, I just, Becky and I just read of a, of a pastor, um, I don't remember where he's from, 30,000, it's a big church, 30,000 people, and they, they just had to let him go. They've been addressing his alcoholism and his inappropriate relationships, relationships with women, and, uh, and they took him out of ministry. He started the church. He's the founder of the church. And, and it's a travesty. It's a, it's a shameful thing and, a, and, and, a, and, a, and a, just a discouraging thing, I'm sure, for that church today as they received that announcement just last week. But it's this sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil, desires, and greed. It doesn't stop. It didn't, it's not just a problem from 2,000 years ago. It's a problem today. And, and so the church was being, um, was being drawn back to the things that they left, so I, I, right away, I'm like, okay, Bob, don't get drawn back by the things that God saved you from. Don't go back there because it will take me or it will take you out of the ministry. The second thing is syncretism. Uh, syncretism is the mixing and blending of different beliefs or religious practices. We have a lot of that here on Kauai. It's really all over the world. Um, and the, the uh, primary way that it comes is really through pantheism, which is the second oldest religion in the world. The first religion of the world was the one that God started, and it wasn't a religion, it was a relationship between Adam and Eve and himself. And right away, in the opening chapters of Genesis, we have the introduction of pantheism, where now everyone can be God, everyone can experience this God quality, we just need to find it, exercise it, acknowledge it, recognize it, and function in it. And so we have the birth of pantheism in the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, and it continues on today where people want to synchronize and syncretize Christianity with other religions. So on Kauai, for instance, we have, um, there's a, a, a unity roundtable of 
ministries and denominations and beliefs that get together on a regular basis to bring unity to the various religions on the island. And so it's made up of Hindus and Buddhists. It's made up of Catholics and Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, Evangelical Christians. Uh, it's made up of all kinds of different people. And it's also made up of atheists of all people. And so this group meets regularly uh, in order to bring unity to all religions. And I want to tell you, it's, a, it's, a doom, it's doomed for failure simply because God doesn't operate in unity that way. Because you cannot be unified with people that are basing their entire life and their entire system, belief system on a different standard. So I want to tell you how you can have unity. If you want unity, it's very, very simple. It's extremely uncomplicated. How would you like to have unity in your marriage? How about that? Let's get away from the, this big picture of other religions. What about just having unity in your marriage? Would you like to have unity in your home life? How about unity in your business? How about unity in the church, which we have here? We're really blessed. You guys are awesome at maintaining the unity of the bond of peace. But how do you maintain unity? And how can we achieve unity? I'll tell you very simply, by having a single standard. You have a single standard that everybody unifies to, and we're suddenly unified. This book is our standard. This Bible is our plumb line. We, uh, we agree with this. We interpret it biblically and we apply it appropriately and suddenly we find ourselves in unity with people in Papua New Guinea and in the Philippines and in Eastern Europe and on Oahu and with the church down the way and with our neighbor who claims to be a Christian. This is how we find unity. We don't get unity by ditching this and pretending we're unified in an impossible way. No, what we do is that we find ourselves unified here. Do you want to have a unified marriage? Then be a couple that makes this the, the very centerpiece of your marriage. It's super simple. Anybody got marriage problems here? You don't, don't raise your hands. Anybody got problems with your kids? Anybody in crisis with, with family that claims Christ? Well, I'll tell you what the answer is. It's this. You might need some help and some counseling along the way, but I can tell you that at the end of the day, this is the answer. This is what will bring unity. It's what brings unity in my family, in my home, in my marriage, and with my kids. The centrality of Jesus Christ. And that's how we find true unity. Syncretism is never going to be the answer. Because they, were synch uh, they had the synchronism or, uh, as a goal, uh, they denied the all-sufficiency of Christ for salvation, for overcoming the flesh, and for wisdom and knowledge. It was called the Colossian heresy. It was built on false philosophy Judaistic ceremonialism, which is basically Jews that were dragging into their New Testament experience, the new covenant of Christ, the old law. They were dragging in circumcision. They were dragging in the dietary restrictions. And they were dragging in the feasts and the festivals that were a part of the culture. And they wouldn't let it go. And they said, Christ plus something else. And that's always the way a false religion operates. It's always, if they do acknowledge Christ, they won't acknowledge him as deity or as God in the flesh, but what they do acknowledge is he's a good guy, a good prophet, a good teacher. He's one of many good teachers, and we accept him, and we appreciate his contribution to religious understanding and spiritual life. But at the end of the day, it's always Christ plus something. And so the Jews also had a problem. It wasn't just the pagans, but the Jews themselves had a problem dragging in something else besides Christ. And I want to encourage you, our standing is based on Christ alone. There is nothing else we can add to it. Nothing can be taken away from it either if we have our faith simply in Christ. That's the basis of our righteousness. That's the basis of our forgiveness. That's the basis of our standing in Christ. That's the basis of everything in Christ alone and in faith alone on the word of God. They were also tangled up in angel worship, which we'll talk about briefly in the weeks to come. And then what I referred to earlier, asceticism, the idea that the harsh treatment of the body can actually bring about a godly life. We know that's not true. Paul tells us that such regulations in the book of Colossians indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. You will not be able to discipline yourself into holiness. You won't be able to do it. It's impossible. I, I, for those people that are type A, it's a temptation to try to accomplish it that way. Type B people, it's like you, you gave up before you started. It's like you knew you weren't going to be able to discipline yourself into that. The type A people are the ones that are more prone to that tendency as I'm just going to, I'm going to work at this. I'm going to bring my A game to this, 
Christian life and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sinning. It doesn't work. What does work? Well, we'll talk about that in the weeks to come, but I'm going to give you a, a, a short preview. In the book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 22, Paul says that the only way to overcome the flesh is being set free from sin. That happens when we receive Christ as our Savior. And secondarily, when we become slaves to God. Those are two different things. When we are set free from our sin, which is a sal salvation, a point of salvation, but then when we become slaves to God, that's a choice. They're both a choice. Receiving Christ is a choice, but then after the fact, it's really a lordship decision. I'm going to be a slave to God. And it says that that kind of a life, set free from the power of sin by the power of Christ and his spirit, and then submitting ourselves to the holy God and the righteous friend and the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, and when we fall in love with him and when we make him our focus and when we make him our objective and our passion in life, the Bible says it will lead, Paul says, it will lead to holiness. It's a byproduct. You know how to destroy your life and completely fail at sin is try to stop sinning. Make that your focus, you know? Beat yourself up, punish yourself in whatever way you can for being bad this week, you know? Boy, talking about a quick way to drive you away from God, that's it. What's God's way? God's way is to simply repent, ask for forgiveness, and then focus on Christ. Love Christ with all your heart. Get his heart. Get his mind. Be in the word. God says that he is going to live his life through you, and it's going to lead to a holy life. Really beautiful. Such freedom that we have in Christ. Well, Paul encourages the believers, and that's the purpose of the book, uh, and he informs them of their high standing. He calls them holy brethren, hoi hagioi, and it means saints. They're saints not because of their performance. They're saints because they are now free from sin in the eyes of God, and they're clothed in the righteousness of God. And he calls them faithful brethren. Not just believers, but they are faithful brethren. I want to encourage you, church. You're, you're a church that is just... I don't know what to say. I, I love this church. I love you and your families. I love watching what God is doing in you and through you. It's just really invigorating. It's exciting. You're stimulating my spiritual life as I watch you serve the Lord and live for Christ. You are faithful in Christ. And then he tells them that he spends a couple of minutes talking about their identity. And I love this part. He, he says that you, they were in Christ in Colossae. In Christ, in Colossae. Now that's a really, it's, that's such a vague, difficult thing to kind of wrap my mind around. Maybe you too. Can you quickly describe what it means to be in Christ? That's kind of a tough one. It's complicated. Probably take me a 10-page paper to outline what it means to be in Christ. But I can give you a really simple illustration that makes it really easy to understand. And it goes back to the person of Noah and the ark. You remember the story? God was going to pour out his wrath because of the sin of the world. And he found a righteous man, Noah and his family. And he says, build an ark. I'm going to, I'm going to flood the earth. And I'm in essence, it's going to start again. And so Noah built that ark. It took a long time to build that ark. He built it. And then the rain started coming. And God said, get in the ark. Noah didn't say, hey, it's time to get in the ark. No, God said, get in the ark. Noah got in the ark, brought his family. They all got in. Fortunately, God said the animals get in the ark too. He didn't have to round them up. They came on their own, two by two, got in the ark, uh, very compliant. And uh, I'm sure they were giving Moses high, or not Moses, Noah high fives on the way in and, you know, excited to be uh, the pair that live. And they went into the ark. And then the Bible says that God shut the door. Noah didn't shut the door. God shut the door. And then God said he sealed the door. And then God protected them for the year that they were on the seas, waiting for the flood to subside. And friends, I want to tell you that that's what it means to be in Christ. Christ, in essence, is foreshadowed in that ark and God's deliverance. God told us, hey, I've got a methodology for your salvation. Are you interested? Are you willing? Do you want to live? And we said, yeah, we want to live. And then he says, okay, then I've got, a, I've got an ark I've already built for you. Noah had to build his. We don't have to build ours. Jesus Christ is our ark. And he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come, I will save you. I will deliver you. Come and have a relationship with me. Walk in me, be in me, and let me be in you. And so we walked in the door, and God shut the door, and God sealed us by the promise of his Holy Spirit, and God is going to protect us until his wrath passes. That's the promise for the church. 
Isn't this awesome? This is really good stuff. But he says, you are in Christ because you simply believe the gospel message. But then he says, but you're in Colossae too at the same time. Isn't that crazy? They're spiritually, positionally in Christ and safe in Christ. And while they're safe in Christ, going down these rapids of life, simultaneously, they're in Colossae. We happen to be in Kauai today. And most of us live here. Some of you are visiting. Wherever you're from, God has appointed you to be in that place. Do you know that in, in Acts 17, 26, it says that God has actually appointed the exact time, meaning the millennia, the century, the decade, the year that you were born. God appointed that time for you, knew you by name before you existed. And he also appointed the exact place where you would live. Is that crazy? Look it up yourself. Acts 17, 26. And he says he did this so that we might seek him. In other words, there's a reason that God's placed us here and now in this place. And we want to know why. And we go to God and said, why have you placed me here of all time and all places? What do you want to do? What's your purpose for my life? And he says, I'm glad you asked because you belong to me. And I've got a mission for you. And as you're going down this, this torrent of this river, with times of placid, you know, riding and other times where you're not sure you're going to make it through. In all of that, I am with you to the very end of the age as you're an ambassador of my kingdom to the people around you who are going to fall off the edge unless they receive the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so they are in Christ, safely ensconced in the relationship and the security and the inheritance of Christ while they're in a tumultuous, chaotic life in Colossae, just as we are as well. Here's the kicker that's, not, that's coming up in the text too. We're not only in Christ, in Kauai, but we are seated in Christ in the heavenly realm because we have an eternal kingdom and a citizenship that's from above. It's not temporary. It's not worldly. It's not carnal. It's not falling apart. It's not going to hell in a handbasket. It's safe and secure in the heavenly realm. So, we live in three dimensions. We're in Christ, we're in Kauai, and seated at the right hand of God in Christ in the heavenly places. And because we're so safe, we can live radically. We can live without fear. We can live without hand-wringing that everyone else is doing in the world. And we can live for the purpose of God, in the authority of God, by the power of God, where he's invested us with that power and authority to do something fantastic that isn't a temporary fix to a permanent problem that's never going to ultimately be solved in this life, in this world. And he says, be a part of my kingdom where the problems are solved for eternity by coming to Christ and preaching the gospel. Paul imparted to them a blessing by saying grace and peace to you. It's a, the twin sisters of the New Testament. And I won't, I won't talk about that except to say it's always in that order. You always receive the free blessing the undeserved, unmerited favor of God first and it leads to peace. It's like rest. We can rest. We can be at peace and at rest because we have the unmerited favor of God. If we didn't earn it to get it, we're not going to earn it or keep it by being good. So we receive it freely. And because of that, our hearts can be at rest and at peace. Again, he warns them to be careful about uh, a relapse into paganism and against syncretism by affirming the supremacy of Christ. He's the Son of God, He's the all-sufficient Savior, and He's the preeminent Lord. I want to finish just before I wrap this up by giving you all the designations of Christ in the book of Colossians alone to help you realize what a priority it is for Paul to elevate the person of Jesus Christ. I hope it encourages you and strengthens you about the person that you're following, about the person that has saved you and the person that lives in you by the power of the Spirit but also that we have a message to give and a confidence that we can have even in uncertain times. And I've got references for each one of these, but I won't put down the references because it will um, make the presentation of them too choppy. I just want to give you the designations that are found in Colossians regarding Jesus Christ. He's God's son. He's the redeemer. He's the very image of God, the Lord of creation, the head of the church, the fullness of salvation, the reconciler of the universe, 
the one who contains all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, the standard by which all religious teaching is judged, the fullness of God, undiminished deity. The one under whom all power and authority is subjected, the victor over all cosmic powers. The reality of the truth foreshadowed in the Old Testament types and figures in the regulations and rituals. The one exalted and enthroned at the right hand of God in heaven. The one in whom we are complete and in whom our life is hidden, protected, and kept. The one by whom our new life will be glorious, manifested, it is coming again. And it is through him and because of our new life in him that we ought to put away our old manner of life of which we have been marvelous, marvelously saved. He is the preeminent one, the savior, the king, the champion of the church. This is who Paul is declaring. This is who we follow. This is who has saved us. This is who has made these promises to us. And this is the one that's coming again, just as he promised. So we have a job to do. We've been called. We have to be on guard against uh, returning to our, our previous life. We need to be on guard against syncretism. We need to be on guard against being derailed, thinking that we have no power when we've been given power and authority in the most stupendous and incredible and important arena of life. And that's the spiritual area. And we've been told that we belong to Christ and that we have been sent by Christ and that we live in essence in three dimensions, in Christ, in Kauai for a temporary period of time or wherever you're from, and then finally in the presence of God for all eternity, seated at the right hand of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Wow. Wow. This is amazing what God has done for us. Let's rejoice in it. Let's spread the word. Let's invite people to church. Let's let people know who are heading down this stream on their twin air mattress without a paddle. And let's be the people that are riding right along with them with our twin air mattress, but with a, a, a line right to the king of kings and the throne where we know at any moment's notice, our father, our savior is gonna come and snatch us away. We have no worry, no concern, no fret, no anxiety, because we know the end of the story, but those around us don't, and they need the lifeline. Be a man or woman that extends that lifeline of the gospel of Jesus Christ in a very uncertain and turbulent time. Father, we thank you for this time and our, and our time of fellowship. I pray that you'd bless the men and women and young people of this church. God, what a blessing to serve in this church. I love to be a person that gossips about this fellowship in a holy way, highlighting and 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 um, highlighting the, the various aspects and the qualities, their characteristics, their, their service, their heart for you, their passion for the kingdom, their continuous uh, effort to say no to sin and yes to righteousness, their availability, their willingness to serve not just the body of Christ, but their neighbors and their friends, their passion for the gospel, their love for you, their love for one another, and their love for the lost, and their willingness to answer that call as ambassadors of this message of reconciliation and continue to preach and continue to teach and continue to communicate a lost world to a lost world this incredible message of salvation in Christ alone. There is no other name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved. And Jesus, you said it yourself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And so, Father, we pray that you would give us courage this week and opportunity and open doors and love and, and the words to be able to speak that others might know, others might hear, and others might be saved. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. And we pray together. Amen. Okay, let's stand and we're going to close with the final worship song. God bless you guys. Uh, anybody that would like to, I want to uh, say that we want to pray for the people that we mentioned earlier. So Rusty's here. Lynn is here. Uh, I don't know. Is Terry here? Terry, are you here? Terry Hogue? I, don't, I didn't see her. But uh, if, uh, if you'd like to pray with us, we're going to lay hands on them and anoint them with oil as well. Uh, and if anyone else wants prayer for anything, come on up. We'll pray for you. Otherwise, have a great week. And we'll see you soon. God bless.